Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 728, that is 728 of the Agostino Zynga Show, and I hope you're doing well wherever this lovely pod may find you, I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? All good, all things considered. I cannot complain. All good, all things considered. I cannot complain. The past couple of days have been an interesting one because I'm not sure if some of you've noticed through the power of my 720p webcam. If you're watching it via YouTube, you may have seen it. Maybe you haven't. But I've definitely been taking up more of my skin. Well, I've been taking my skincare a lot more, a more, lot more seriously in these last couple of days or last couple of weeks, actually. Um, I bought a whole set of stuff. Like, I think most people do this, right? You end up doing a bit of a, you know, you end up going down weird YouTube rabbit holes and you usually end up on some weird page where like you maybe, I think I end up on looks maxing thing. But I think I finally started it through like, you know, looking at Korean facial skincare type of stuff. And you just end up going this weird rabbit hole, right? To the point where you start maybe end up to the looks maxing thing. So I ended up doing that. And then one late night, I ended up buying a lot of stuff for my skincare routine on Amazon. But like a guy, I just bought it and then put it in my cupboard and never looked at it again. So I had all this stuff in my cupboard that I never actually knew I had that was, you know, basically a whole kit of stuff. So then the other day I was thinking, oh, let me just start it or the other week. Let me start doing it and start taking it seriously, start doing it in the morning, start doing it before I go to sleep. And then I was um, looking at another video again, because, you know, you got to double check your videos and just trying to make sure that I've got everything. And then when I was looking at my cupboard, I was like, oh, shit, I actually did buy everything. Like I was trying to buy more stuff to add to stuff I already have. But when I checked the cupboard, I realized I actually bought all the stuff before, but I just didn't open it. So a big palm to face moment there for me. But I did end up doing it for a few weeks. You know, it's been a bit spotty. So there's been a couple of days I missed it. But, you know, I've been somewhat consistent with it over the last couple of weeks. And I have to be honest, like you can't really see via the flipping camera probably because the quality isn't the greatest. I'm trying my best with the lighting and shit. And obviously I'll upgrade it sooner rather than later when I start, you know, putting more money into stuff. But so far, if you can look at the flipping cam, my skin's actually looking pretty good. Like, I'm. don't get me wrong. It's never looked crazy bad, but it definitely has helped it like you know I, I don't think I'm I, I think I was one of those people like because I just naturally have just because of the you know the luck of my fucking genetics and my parents you know god bless them for giving birth to me because I just you know ended up with good skin it's not really nothing that I kind of chose but then I just took it for granted so I thought you know what instead of taking it for granted why not just you know take care of the thing that you have that most people would kind of die for which is you know generally decent enough skin um, even though I had flipping expo when I was younger and stuff, it hasn't really affected me too much in my older age. So I've been using it and doing the skincare quite regularly. And I have to be honest, like it's not too bad. I understand people do it now. Apart from the obvious vanity of it, right? And you end up kind of looking a bit better. Your skincare, your, your sorry, your face looks, you know, you have that kind of glassy effect on your face, sometimes shiny and you just look more youthful and whatever it may be. Apart from all that, one thing that I've noticed that's really cool about it is just the, the somewhat weird mentally mental health clarity calming side of things this routine that you do in the morning in the evenings um and it kind of reminds me of running or it kind of reminds you of going to the gym you might not want to go um in the mornings or in the evenings but then you end up you know obviously trying to you know just clenching your teeth and going anyway and then the warm-up maybe is a bit tight is a bit hard you're a bit tight you're a bit you know tired but as soon as you get into the workout 10 minutes later you're really happy that you made a decision to go and i think the same thing happens with my kind of skincare routine i start i'm like oh here we go again cleanser exfoliator toner um serum moisturizer sunscreen all this whatever right you're fucking oh here we go again but when you end up doing it you're like oh man i'm so happy i did do it like you take you know again we don't really i know for myself anyway i don't really pamper myself much i just kind of get on with things i'm just a typical man in that regard ball up all my emotions don't really pamper myself just kind of grit my teeth and kind of bear through it so having an opportunity to sort of like pamper myself and treat myself like a fucking quote-unquote princess is actually quite nice i get it i completely get why ladies out there kind of love these uh, and you know moments where they can just unwind at home you know put a whole face mask on and just do nothing i mean scented candles I mean, imagine if i went the whole way i did the whole scented candles i got some good lighting i I'd got some LEDs, I dimmed the light in, maybe some nice curtains, maybe some good jazz playing in the background, all that stuff kind of adds and it kind of really does help, especially living in this flipping, 
you know, bad vibe city that I live in in London, all those things can actually help to kind of somewhat bolster your mood and, you know, make you <laughs> somewhat happy considering all the flipping crap shit that's happening daily. So that's been a pretty decent thing. So I've been happy about that. Another thing I've been happy about, I also bought a two pairs, well, I bought a set of speakers basically um, to replace the crappy speaker that I had beforehand, which was horrendous. It was a speaker that I obviously took from my mum's before I moved and stuff and it was not the greatest quality had weird sound it was kind of ratty and i obviously threw that away so glad i did that but i ended up buying some really good monitors i would call them um that you know people could use for a little home studio and whatnot and what i realized about because again i haven't bought a new set of monitors in years so i don't know anything about what's going on right but and also i've kind of used krks when i've been playing at like a house parties and stuff and they're obviously pretty cool in terms of quality and stuff maybe a little bit overrated for the price but definitely you know they give you good sound coverage when you're playing at a house party and stuff but what i realized if you get good monitors especially ones that are like i don't know 60 quid 80 quid plus um for your room or whatever you'll realize most likely they have a really good i don't know how to describe the sound but essentially what happens is that even if you put it at like 9 a.m you can still kind of hear most things but it doesn't bleed throughout the entirety of the room it doesn't end up kind of you know passing through walls annoying your neighbors and whatnot and i was doing a bit of mixing at home i put it at like you know i say like 11 12 you know pm kind of um you know sign wherever it is a marker and it was fairly decent i was able to kind of hear myself playing and whatnot and obviously i wasn't able to disturb my my flipping neighbors in the apartment block that i live in but one thing I did notice as well when I was mixing, because again, I haven't been doing a lot of mixing at home. I've been kind of just waiting for my sets at Flipping Pirate Studios, but I thought it's a bit of a waste of time to do that. And it's obviously holding me back in terms of not getting a lot of practice in and sending out mixes to clubs and whatnot and, you know, trying to get myself back out there. Um, I realised that there's something that I kind of stopped doing because I convinced myself Pirate was the only way forward. You do know if you mix on like a MIDI controller, like I've, I've got like a basic, you know, Pioneer MIDI controller. I think it's like a DJJ SB3 or something, right? It's a basic one. They plug in through your flipping USB and stuff. Really good, you know, standard quality, but it's pretty basic. But I didn't realize that you can essentially mix through your headphones. You don't need to have monitors. So you can basically, you know, even if you have flatmates or you have like a, you know, you don't want to, you know, wake up your neighbors and play all the way through the night you can basically have your headphones on and you can monitor the sound like coming out and also cue your music through your headphones it's pretty cool and the feature kind of works really intuitively like you get your obviously when you put your headphones into the flipping um, midi controller you can hear whatever side of the deck you want to hear by pressing a button on one and two but you can also can hear the master but when you hear the master and then you press the two or one deck to cue the next tune in it sort of like fades or lowers automatically the sound of the master so you can can hear a little bit of the deck you're queuing it's really intuitive and works really well again it's not perfect but if you it's a roundabout way to kind of get a lot of mixes done so what i'm doing now going forward is i'm re not restarting but i'm going to be posting more of my test mix at the moment i'm doing one a day i already dropped one the other day called test mix number 64 and i'm going to try to get this up until 100 fairly quickly in the next couple of weeks and whatnot so i'll be banging out the daily mixes and stuff so keep an eye on that one obviously if you want to check this out this is at my soundcloud which is soundcloud.com for slash handsome black man that's soundcloud.com forward slash handsome black man all one word and you'll see my newest mix which is test mix number five 65 sorry it's mostly house music it's about 54 minutes long and whatnot original artwork obviously there by me as well and there's obviously the track listing that you can find below as well if you want to kind of have an idea on what the tunes are played and whatnot but i'm going to be doing that fairly often now going forward so be there like i said there'll be a mix coming out every single day from me so check that out and this is obviously on top of what i'm going to be be doing that pirate so i'll be probably doing a little pirate session in the midweek again so check me out on there i'll be live streaming i think probably there on wednesday i think i'll try and do it on wednesday or something when i got some time so i'll be doing those but then i'll be also doing these test messages and kind of making sure that i'm keeping up on it because one thing i've kind of neglected over the years has been my soundcloud so definitely check that out soundcloud.com for just handsome black man for all of my dj mixes and stuff and you'll find them on there and the latest one is number 65 so i'll put that in the description for you guys who are listening through the audio pod and obviously if i clip this up i'll put it in the description as well so you can find it but you can find it at soundcloud.com forward slash handsome black man all one word on soundcloud check this out check it out do not delay do not delay moving on from that one i also watched over the weekend um the killer on netflix starring michael fassbender right and it's a 
decent movie i'm not gonna lie for a netflix movie very very good um if you're not aware i think this is directed by david fincher the same guy that did fight club the same guy that did x no that did zodiac's killer sorry that movie or zodiac i think it's just called um and i think another one as well with um i forgot what his name is the one where they lose their memory i forgot the name but he did quite a few decent movies right that i'm kind of a good fan of big fan of sorry i saw the trailer come out earlier the year i was obviously really excited about it david michael fassman essentially plays uh, an assassin for hire and it's really cool because the soundtrack's amazing it's all the smiths and it kind of reminds me of the the time that i kind of found out about the smiths which was fairly which was through skateboarding actually wild to think that but most of that music came through skateboarding when i first started skating when i was about what 16 17 I jumped on it and I remember first going to like Slam City Skates and basically learning about the Smiths through that. I think there was one, there was one sort of like, I think a magazine launch or something. I forgot what it was. It might, it, maybe it was Grey Skate Magazine. When Grey Skate Magazine launched, if you know what that is, if you're a skater, you know what one's a free little magazine that they have. And I think when Grey Skate Mag launched, I think there was some sort of like launch party somewhere in central London that I kind of skated over to. It was kind of cool. I loved that whole time. It was really, really fun. And then um, I, ended, I think there were some people were DJing, obviously, some of the skater guys, and they were playing the, the Smiths, and I'd never heard of them. Literally, had never heard of the Smiths. I'm from Enns. Do you know what I mean? Like, why would I have, have known who fucking Morrissey is, right? And I remember asking somebody who this was, and I was just obsessed with it, and, you know, seeing everybody kind of dancing along to it, singing along to it. And then from, you know, from then on, on my fucking iPod, I was listening to that all the time. So it's pretty cool to see this guy um, that Michael Fassbender plays, the assassin, is obsessed with the Smiths also. It's kind of basically a soundtrack for the entire thing. And he's got an iPod. And it kind of reminded me again of the iPod use of how much music I listen to on the iPod, man without any smartphone features the amount of music i used to get through on that ipod was crazy like every flipping day every week i'd be torrenting flipping new albums ripping them onto my flipping thing i'd be putting audio books on there i'd be putting little movies on there that's when i had that i forgot what it was i think it was like ipod classic that had the live screen that you could watch films on it on the click wheel such a good flipping gadget i wish they would bring that back in some way i know they have ipods now they're basically just iphones though but i love that ipod just you know basically design tactile click wheel and stuff and um, i've seen people online actually i've seen a few people do mods of ipods where they update the if i'm not mistaken they update the flipping the storage they obviously mod the outer casing change the different colors or whatnot i, I kind of like the standard sort of like porcelain white glass front fixture with the aluminium back casing and it kind of dented and scratched it used it more i've seen people do that obviously update the st storage change the color of it the case the click wheel the back case um upgrade the battery and i've also seen them do a thing where they've they've included a little um bluetooth module so you can essentially use it as a as a standard thing that people use now nowadays with your bluetooth headphones which has been kind of cool to see but obviously the sound isn't the greatest because you're kind of doing a little hack and whatever maybe but it can be done or you could just buy it obviously already done for you but there are people doing mods of blue of um uh, ipods with bluetooth speakers sorry with bluetooth capability so you connect your headphones with them so that's super super cool but again back to the movie i have to be honest as much as i liked it I kind of some people are a little bit on the fence about it because I'd probably give it a little bit of like a six or seven out of ten, mostly because it wasn't sinister enough. I expected it to be a little bit darker, to be a little bit more gory, um, to be a little bit more scary. You know, it just didn't feel that way. Um, at no point was I really like. Who's that guy? I forgot what his name. I think it's um. I, I forgot the. I think he's like a Spanish actor, and I think he's in a movie, No Country for Old Men. Do you remember that one? where he's kind of walking around with this fucking weird sort of like, I don't know what kind of gun it was. I think it was like shooting fucking nails or something, right? It was fucking insane. It's like a little cut of, it's like a little shoon of shotgun. But that character in fucking No Country for Old Men, he was scary. Do you remember how scary that character was? Like he, even flipping, um, what's his name? fucking god bless the dead the guy from uh, the wire that was whistling right the gay dude with the fucking long trench coat there was a fucking scary vibe at him whenever he came on screen i just never felt scary I, I never felt scared of michael fassbender's character in this movie he just didn't come across sinister enough i did love the line about um him blending in or like you know because him blending in and also being left alone because he dressed like a german tourist i thought that was fairly funny it seems like in tourist in terms of the hierarchy of annoying tourist um uk 
um, or British people, German people, and probably Chinese are definitely in the top five, it sounds like, around the world. Maybe, of course, with Americans. We're probably the top five, yeah. I don't know who the other one is. So probably be British number one, maybe German two, or maybe American two, German three, and Chinese four. But I forgot there's definitely another group in there, but that was a pretty fun little line. Um, and yeah, and I thought the ending was a little bit tame as well. And again, not going to spoil it for you if you're going to watch it, but I didn't really like the ending too tough. I think, I thought it started off really strong. I loved all the internal monologue going on there. Um, you know, that was pretty entertaining. Some of the dialogue was pretty cool. He hardly said anything, the character, to other people, but it was a lot of him talking to himself in his head. Um, the music soundtrack was fucking amazing. Obviously shot really well, but I just would have wanted more skill frightening scary side of things it just didn't feel scary enough for me and that's why i'd probably give it a six or seven out of ten but again for a netflix movie for a netflix movie it's definitely a 10 out of 10 let's say that but in terms of a david fincher movie i think he could have come way harder and again that's a pause it should be a pause i feel like it's a pause but we can continue a big up david fincher big up netflix big up the killer and again michael fassbender I, I, he's one of my favorite flipping um, actors as well he's got such a great range in terms of what he could play and he's absolutely bodied up in this flipping movie as well doing all the great yoga and whatnot just looking absolutely cut up for days so yeah he's flipping amazing check it out if you're a fan of him and david fincher or just those type of movies overall definitely definitely very entertaining moving on from that i've also been watching invincible season two and i have to be honest man maybe i've spoiled myself because i've been checking out channels like comics explained and a few others out there who which basically i've gone on to watch the entire thing i think i watched one particular video from comics explained on youtube where he essentially has a five-hour video breaking down covering the entire you know invincible law and breaking it you know basically finishing the whole story so i know what's basically going to happen i've read all the spoilers but still it's such a fascinating you know um comic book series that i don't mind waiting to kind of see it again on tv especially in an animation so especially in this animated series on amazon prime but i have to be honest so far season two has been kind of underwhelmed first off there's not enough blood in it like if you see some of the scans from invincible the actual comic books which i'll probably end up buying myself for the for the time that we're at in terms of because the, the series basically follows the comic books pretty like for like if anything they focus in on a few of the stories more so than the comics like this on season two now there's a lot of focus in um what's his face invincible's mum, right how she's kind of dealing with the fact that omni man you know did what he did and ran away and stuff and he basically doesn't think of her too well and whatnot or basically abandoned her and left her to dust and how she's basically been a been having to kind of pick up the scraps of it and she obviously goes into a downward spiral of alcoholism right she becomes an alcoholic and you know it's a pretty decent storyline and that's kind of and there's a few other ones in there as well where they kind of focus on a few of the other characters but animation wise there's just not enough blood and gore if you see season two honestly via the comics the amount of fucking crazy battles and fights that happen the amount of blood and guts that are spilled all over the place is fucking crazy it's just not enough for me it just looks a little bit tame it looks a little bit too pg and they really need to kind of turn up the fucking gore a little bit on this it's kind of getting a little bit annoying to be fair um and it's kind of dragging on and also having a break mid-season for an animated series is really unforgivable it kind of reminds me of why i fell out of love with dbz right dragon ball z back in the day they'd always have these fucking annoying filler episodes they'd pause all the time in between seasons and by the time they'd come back anyway you know the writing was terrible towards the end anyway it's obviously a good introduction to anime but for the most part you know you probably need to graduate from that sort of shit and i just think you know for the animated series especially considering how detailed and fucking vast the fucking source material is these guys have no excuse to just bail mid-season on this now it just feels a little <coughs> sorry it feels a little bit annoying so I have to wait a while to kind of get the rest, the second half of season two. Um, obviously, most of it has been impacted because of the strikes and shit, but I still think they should have had enough of this done for an animated series, to be fair. But again, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm overlooking how hard it is to actually put together an animated series and actually finish it. Maybe it's a word that goes into it, but that's a bit disappointing. And like I said, it's just not enough blood, not enough guts and just feels a little bit tame to be honest so i've not really been that impressed with season two of invincible but of course i'm going to continue on and finish it anyway because once you start something you might as well end it once you start something you might as well end it moving on from that what else have we got here to cover oh yeah carly close buying id magazine am i the only person that doesn't really like this news 
Am I the only person that thinks this is probably the end of ID Magazine as we know it? Of course, we all know magazines aren't really, you know, especially ID, they're not really the most counterculture, punk, um, you know, um, youth-led manifesto that they once was when they were launched. We know that. But I feel like Carly Close is like, the antithesis she's like the complete opposite of that anyway right even if she wanted to try to be that she's a complete opposite she's obviously really young she's obviously got a lot of you know experience in mod in sorry in fashion with her modeling career and whatnot and everything else she's done in fashion but i feel like as a person she's probably the worst person that you'd want to buy a magazine like id that's trying to keep on you know the edge of flipping counterculture that's trying to represent the kids the new generation coming up and that's just trying to be a fun interesting fashion magazine there's nothing fun and interesting about carly close when it comes to being a model when it comes to being a fashion inside or anything there's not you know i don't really see kids thinking about her in that way maybe in terms of a model in terms of someone to look at fair enough but she's just not she's probably the last person i'd want to buy a magazine like id and it's a really sad situation to see to be fair but again it kind of i guess maybe we have to wait and see how it kind of plays out but so far considering what i've seen online about her initial uh, move to basically stamp her authority on ID was to get rid of that ceasefire post that ID had on their Instagram post, right? Um, regarding the conflict going on at the moment now between Israel and Gaza and shit, right? Obviously free Palestine until the end. But that move already showed me that it's definitely going to be a lot of that kind of you know involved in terms of how she's going to operate id a lot of her own politics are going to influence it. again for better or worse i guess it kind of is what it is but i just think that being your first move considering what the current vibe is at the moment with what's going on with god with, with, the, with the current flipping genocide going on now at the moment you kind of have to read the room and you kind of maybe have to i would say acquiesce a little bit to your readership and maybe understand what position they're kind of holding or if anything if you want to be a little bit you know if you want to be a little bit forward thinking maybe use the opportunity to have you know very interesting detailed uncomfortable conversations with both sides right maybe have representatives from israel representatives from plans of palestine essentially i would say quote unquote fighting their case or presenting their case via the magazine in that way maybe that's a great way to go about it but for her to kind of do the first move again this has been for some what i've been seeing on twitter this has been something that's been ratified by a lot of people who basically been saying oh that post was on there before i think this is the one right um it's um as you can see here somebody posted it on fashion twitter actually and i think this is on around november the 10th they posted yeah um ceasefire now and the caption was this weekend millions of people worldwide will merge <coughs> sorry solidarity yeah most many people worldwide will dance sorry sorry dance march and solidarity to palestine people um who are at risk of genocide with the violent via the violent acts carried out by the israeli government so that was on there before and of course if you look now at the id instagram page you will see that that ceasefire post isn't there anymore it's not there all right clearly they've kind of decided to sort of move on from that and basically she decided i guess to plant her flag in the ground as to where she kind of stands in that conflict which makes sense right when you consider who she's married to gerard kushner and everything you kind of get why that happened it's no surprise but i just think it's a weird first move to make when you're taking over such a youth led um you know i'd say mostly left leaning you know magazine to make that your first move is really strange if anything um you just continue on and just kind of put that to bed and maybe not add to it and uh, that might be one thing but to go on and kind of delete that it feels a bit strange to be me in my own personal opinion and again um having read a few things to people on the inside via fashion twitter that was essentially something that she did so anyway let's read a cut article that kind of breaks down what actually happened so it says the following <coughs> So about that it says looks like carly close is adding to her roster of glossy magazines the supermodel has officially acquired id magazine a beloved publication that covers fashion music and youth culture from vice media which filed for bankruptcy earlier this year according to wwd Kloss will reserve as CEO while current editor-in-chief Alistair McKim will stay on as chief creative officer and global editor-in-chief. By the way, this ain't going to last long also. Um, whenever somebody like this comes in, she's probably got her own ideas on who wants, you know, who she wants to be a chief executive officer or global, uh, you know, editor, sorry, global editor-in-chief. And even though Alistair McKim has done some amazing things over the years, it's definitely one of my favorites when it comes to the current roster over there flipping id um don't be surprised especially some of his styling work don't be surprised if Alison mckim gets the boot very soon or he ends up leaving you know 
via fucking you know mutually consent whatever that thing is um i'm sure she's gonna bring in her own people there's no way he's gonna stay there for a long time especially if she starts kind of you know pushing her politics down his throat and shit um or starts to kind of you know really have a handle on what goes on the page what goes on the instagram what goes on the pages of the magazine it continues rumors of the supermodel purchasing a publication have been rumbling around the industry since late august and close is no stranger to purchasing media. In 2020, the model led a group of investors, including fellow model Kai Gerber, F1 racer star Lewis Hamilton, producer Jason Bloom, to purchase W Magazine again. Why? It's no wonder that magazine's gone. To, every magazine she's touched so far has gone to shit. I used to buy W, I used to buy ID, and they've all gone to shit. So, well, ID is obviously going to go to shit soon, but it's no surprise really. Her, she's definitely got the you know the opposite of the Midas touch. I feel like it seems close. A model turned entrepreneur and essentially proxy to the billions of the Kushner estate state um has been building a diverse portfolio of our own notably cod Co cody with Clossy, which runs a free coding campaign for girls and a closetti honestly this is the person that you want to fucking buy id she's got a coding with Clossy and a thing called closetti a fashion-based world within the roblox metaverse that allows players to style themselves and climb the ranks and become editor-in-chief yo that's so fucking shit that sounds so fucking lame. The names of the companies are so fucking uncreative. It's no surprise that my prediction will probably end up coming true. ID is definitely RIP'd. If it's not RIP'd already, because again, I haven't bought a recent ID, a copy of ID in a very long time. I've got a pretty decent collection of stuff I'm going to probably go through now and show you of old IDs I used to kind of purchase back in the day. Some from eBay and some just from the shops and shit. But I haven't bought ID in a very, very long time. Um, You know, I don't really care for it as a magazine anymore especially with the internet being what it is but i just don't think it's you know on the cutting edge as it once was and of course most of it has to do because all the cool and interesting people that used to work at the company have left on to do their own thing but yeah if anything if i wasn't buying it then i'm probably not going to buy it under the stewardship or leadership of carly close to be fair like again a person that's got code code with Clossy and code spelled k-o-d obviously because her name is carly close like, come on bro get over yourself she also has reportedly invested in several digital startups including a business that aims to integrate um digital authentication ids into clothing fucking now could you get more big brother than that fuck me sure it takes more money to buy a magazine but it takes grit and borderline sheer insanity to write for one carly join us won't you don't be some far figured over her lord but put pen where the wallet is and get that byline <clears throat> i don't know why the cut is kind of pining for her a little bit it's giving fucking zionist propaganda but hey we move and um according to the lovely lauren sherman this is the inside scoop it says carly closest bedford media has acquired id from vice as we said she'll serve as id ceo while Ed Alison mckim will be promoted to chief executive officer so chief creative officer and global eic <clears throat> terms of the deal weren't disclosed so like i said i still think if you're Alison McKim, you've probably been around long enough. You know Wagwan. I think he's aware his days are probably going to be numbered. Um, you know, get the most as you can out of it. And I would anticipate, most likely or not, she'll probably end up getting her own person um, to have that role very soon because I'm sure they'll come to some point where there'll be disagreement in terms of politics, in terms of direction, in terms of micromanagement, whatever it may be, right? In notes giving, whatever. Because, you know, she bought the company. She bought the magazine. It's her thing. I get it. You can kind of do what you want, but I think that's going to definitely lead to a lot of issues going forward. So don't expect this to kind of last. But again, like I said, for her first move to allegedly to be to remove this ceasefire post, I honestly don't see any good things happening anytime soon with ID. I think the ID that I kind of knew that I kind of grew up on, that was, I think, a represent a representation of counterculture. It was a way for me to kind of get information and understanding on things, especially subculture wise in places that I probably would never visit and have the, the basically the inside scoop via some incredible writing some incredible editorial some incredible photography and just in general styling uh, music reviews all amazing things i just don't think it's that place anymore if you want to get that sort of stuff i'm sure there are decent enough content creators on tiktok that are probably going to give you a better inside scoop without all the fucking you know zionist fucking tea or zionist salt sprinkled over it so that's the unfortunate side of all those things and it's really unfortunate because again like i said i've got a decent enough collection of flipping id magazines i've shown you here right i've got this 9997 um, id flipping issue with kate moss on there right riding the little fucking pony from back in the day i've got like just too many decent ones too too many 
like this one. You've got another one here. We also got, I've got one with a fucking course cover. If you know, you know, this goes for a pretty penny on the eBay. And that's just too many fucking good ones, right? I think I've even got one here with, um, with that features Cassie and Diddy, actually. It's a pretty good cover, but considering everything that's been going on, that's probably going to either going to be tanking on eBay or it's going to be going up in value. There's one, of course, with Bjork. We've got a really cool one with fucking Naomi Campbell on the front also. And then, yeah, this is the Cassie Diddy one. There's a legendary one with fucking Cassie and Diddy from back in the day that I also have as well. So, again, like I said, unfortunate from fucking ID. They're not definitely the magazine that I kind of knew and love or grew up on. No way, shape or form. It is something that I'm really interested in or give a crap about. And unfortunately, if you're currently there, I'm sure you're aware that your days of fun and frolicking around are probably over because, you know, Carly Close is probably the, the complete opposite of cool and somebody that I probably wouldn't be that inspired to be leading my, um, you know, counterculture, youth-led kind of magazine. If anything, it would have been better if she came in and probably just... Maybe replace Alison with Kim, right? But replace them with just maybe some new blood and kind of, you know, acted like a, act like a benefactor in a way, right? Kind of be the money behind the mag, but go be completely hands off and put out a statement, and say, hey, this magazine's obviously been something that I've always kind of looked at when I was younger. It always felt to me like it represented youth culture and was always on the cutting edge of it. Obviously, I'm not the kind of target market for it, but I always, I want to put, I don't know, I want to put the kids in charge and kind of let them sort of lead this going forward. And that would be the great way to kind of do it and to kind of be hands off and kind of let the kids do what they want to do with the mag and kind of go from there and just be kind of like you know the overseeing eye in that respect and put the money behind it that might be an actual good way to kind of go about things and it'll end up being successful i think that way and then you could also be the person that's kind of responsible for the new generation success you could put some people on maybe have some people in between that can kind of report back to you whatever maybe that would have been a better way to go about it but i've got a feeling she's definitely going to want to pull up her her fucking you know her um what you call it <laughs> what was i gonna say She's definitely going to pull up her fucking Tory Birch or whatever that fucking brand is, that dead brand, um, sleeves and get to work and actually think she's actually going to be an actual editor and actually think she's going to be able to tell these kids anything new, which is going to be interesting to see. So let's see how it plays out, but I'm not, you know, I'm not anticipating anything good anytime soon to be completely fair. So let's see what I want. Moving on and seeing elsewhere, Guan, let's look at Kif. No, not Kif. Um, Amy Leondor, actually. I always say Kif because I think they share a lot of sensibilities, right? There's a lot of fucking aesthetics that ALD and Kif share, unfortunately. I guess because they service essentially the, the same customer. ALD maybe started off serving that guy that's like, you know, 25 plus who's maybe got their first decent job but still wants to look kind of cool and i guess kiff is slowly but surely trying to age their customer upwards right they maybe started off doing the whole tracksuit stuff but now they're doing a lot of like cut and sew a lot of what you deem to be ready wear whatever it may be going forward so that's maybe why i confuse them anyway that being said enough about me fucking um trying to cop my please they recently dropped their winter 2023 uniform the text here emily and door presents the winter uni uniform for 2023 featuring hero items such as a double breasted teddy coat full tuxedo set leather down program and a mitchell nest jersey that's actually a really good um blurb to describe where they're at as a brand in it that their hero items are a double breasted teddy coat a full tuxedo set, a leather down program, and a Mitchell Ness jersey. The only thing streetwear about this is probably this Mitchell Ness shit. Everything else is very menswear adjacent. So it definitely sees that they're basically trying to point in that direction more than anything else. Um, yeah, so I really like what they've got going on here so far with these first two looks. Also, another note is I'm a big fan of this model. Um, obviously, I, I like the the other models that I usually have with the, the, the two black twins. They look incredibly cool, but I also like when they use this white guy. He definitely does a good job in terms of presenting these clothes very well. Um, this jacket here, this overcoat is absolutely incredible. Um, what is he wearing here? This is a teddy top coat. Fucking hell. It's made out of double, what is it? Teddy, what's it made out of? It doesn't say actually. There's also a double breasted suit underneath there, a wall envoy hat, which is incredible, right? Russian envoy, Soviet Union thing, and then some slippers, right? I'm assuming. Oh, it's no, it's not slippers. What are these loafers? He's also got a Venetian loafer on. So those look really cool. Um, on the other side, you've got this really nice. Is that a leather bub? Is that a leather down jacket? That looks incredible. David's wearing a leather down puffer uh, in black with a mohair beanie. And Venetian loafer and tuxedo, tuxedo trousers. This looks fucking incredible. I love the look of this, to be fair. One of my favorites on there. 
You've also got this plush, amazing um, hoodie. What's this is made out of as well? What is this? This is made out of a full zip hoodie with Merlot and also a flyer pant and a fleece beanie. Not really a fan of the pants. Or, no, actually, that's not one of my favorite looks. I'm not really a fan of that. This is one of my favorites here. This is definitely something I would obviously wear here with this incredible little bucket hat. Again, I wish bucket hats would look this cool on me. They just don't. It's one of those things that I've never really tried to buy. It's like a camp cat, like Supreme Camp Cat. So I wish I could get my fucking massive 758s head to fit in the supreme cam cat because i'll be wearing them every single day but my head just doesn't fit in them so it's annoying and i wish my head would look good in bucket hats also i remember the time when schoolboy q was popping up and he was wearing them every day i tried to do the bucket hat thing and it just didn't work the same way it worked on schoolboy q unfortunately um it, this guy looks like yeah so it's a it's an alpaca fleece pullover which also i guess is the alpaca oh no it's a wool beanie um bucket hat was in camel and a pleated pant fucking incredible i love those and also the boots i guess might be a collab who knows on that one um there's obviously you showed you that one and then there's a, this other this the suiting is really good to be fair i'm not gonna lie the suit options are great um you might be a little bit of an idiot to spend the money that ald are gonna be paying or price you know um charging for a suit you might want to go to an actual suit manufacturer or maybe Savile Row to get one done for you properly but you know if you maybe want to get that one-stop shop where you can buy everything um or you can kind of deck out your whole entire wardrobe via them then it's not a bad option because the cuts are really nice man that looks like a really well well put together suit i'm not mad at that in the slightest um they've also got this really great cardigan i love this design and this cardigan that looks incredibly nice with them um, the shirt and the vest um on underneath and the chain again the styling is awesome on ald whoever does the styling there does a really good job um again there's a the leather down puffer oh look at that is that double-breasted cardigan vesting what the fuck is that that is brilliant there David is wearing a leather down and a mohair beanie and a double-breasted mohair cardigan. Yeah, I'm all over that. That is fucking gorgeous. And look at the buttons. Some big, nice, round, pearly buttons there. No pause needed. And I love those trousers too and the wallabies. You got this great leather jacket here, a leather track jacket. A track jacket made in leather. Such a good little spin in it. You got the nice Wrangland sleeves there. The leather looks fucking plush. Yeah, really nice. Not mad at that in the slightest. Oh, look at those leather jogging, leather track pants. Oof, I'm not. F it's it's giving. It's definitely Russian inspired, isn't it? There's the, 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 there's a lot of like old Soviet Union shit going on here. This kind of feels like something some characters in um, what's that series called? I think the Americans would wear. Definitely something of uh, along that kind of line. David is wearing a tuxedo jacket and leather track pants and a leather driver's hat. Um, there's this um, look as well with the baseball jersey I'm not a fan of that in the slightest that looks horrendous not really for me but yeah the rest of it obviously is available down below as you can see the individual pieces but some definitely some strong looks here I think the one here with the double breasted um, cardigan vesting is fucking one of my favorites as is this gray suit option and this one with the cardigan and that hat what's that hat called actually that hat is cool this i could actually look good in this this kind of peaky blinder shit going on there i think i could actually pull that off it's a peaky blinder hat but it's actually got two flaps two ear flaps to cover your ears so it kind of looks good i guess covered over your ears but it's also got this decent element you can clip it on top and kind of give it a little bit of a styling little twist on that regard what do they call this hat they call it the herringbone ear flap hat so yeah that was pretty cool i could definitely do make that work and then of course this um half zip pullover thing this quarter whatever this looks really cool as well so what is it it's a alpaca fleece pullover and again the the bucket hat looks great and then of course these two looks here at the top are really awesome so big up aod for always putting out cool interesting shit again love what they do um the price range is a bit crazy for me it's kind of vis for me price but again i can't complain i really can't with the level of quality that they put out um, moving on from that one <clears throat> I wanted to touch upon this because I think that this girl deserves her flowers and I think I've said it before that I've, I've been a bit critical because I felt like maybe her design practice with the whole upcycle thing is a little bit boring and maybe it's not her fault maybe she was a pioneer in that regard she definitely kind of I felt like pioneered taking or she was the one that I maybe saw um on my timeline the most who would take like an ikea bag and turn it into a fucking bikini set messenger bag whatever it may be right she was definitely at the front of it and if you're wondering who i'm talking about i'm talking about nicole McLuhan, and obviously she's doing some great work and I, and again after a while i kind of got bored of the whole upcycle thing but 
this girl has been absolutely smashing it when it comes to the fucking footwear collabs at the moment she's got a really sick collab happening very soon or i guess it may be out soon with meryl they look fucking incredible these fucking mock um mockazin type of things whatever they're fucking called what's it called what's the actual shoe model it's called a one trl these are fucking banging but it made me think overall about her flipping run when it comes to footwear collabs and it's been really kind of unprecedented how sick her footwear collabs have been so far over the last what 18 months or so the first one i remember seeing was a vans collab right these incredible slip-ons that she did which are basically inspired by gardening where you had these little slots or these little pockets on the front of the you know on the fucking toe box area where you could put little things in whatever it may be called right um without you know people were doing in the whole gardening thing especially during the pandemic these were really um a big massive fucking thing and i saw them all over the timeline i fucking love these um in the white and green or the brown colorway absolutely incredible obviously the brown colorway is all kind of reminds me of a car heart chore jacket again loads of hard loads of kind of outdoors handwork you know handsy dads you know dads shed kind of thing type of vibes going on there so those are absolutely sick again 10 out of 10 for that one then the other collab she did most recently that most of you will be aware of is the who is a hockey one ones that she did right and um, what's the actual model of it called the model is called i think the mafa right the mafa something that she did recently with hocker which is really sick because if i'm not mistaken it basically is a three in one shoe with the removable kind of sock thing at the top you can kind of change how it looks you can have it look like a boot you can have it look more like a sneaker by taking the entire thing off or you could put some of the 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 covering over the laces and have it look a bit like this as it looks down there right you can basically make it a free on one type of shoe so she actually smashed these and then the other one that she smashed that i thought was really overlooked were these reeboks that she did I think this might have been the first collab that I've seen of her when she kind of popped out after the whole upcycle thing. So, so far, you've got a 10 out of 10 on all of these. And what the cool thing to see here is that I think in days gone by, there was this thing where collaborators or brand people couldn't really go and collaborate with different sportswear brands when it came to shoes you just had to stick with one or there'd be like a weird non-compete clause but i think outside of nike and adidas it feels like you can work with anybody they don't care because i feel like they know they understand that each thing feeds into the next thing if she does a good job with hockey one one most likely people are going to be open to see her do a collab with meryl if she does a good collab with Meryl, most of like people want to see her do a collab with New Balance. Like it actually helps them. Whereas I think some of these companies, they feel a little bit like they're always competing and it's not like that. Like there's enough, you know, crazy sneakers out there who will buy literally everything this girl puts out because they can see and they trust her taste level. It's the same thing with um the guy that does um Admin Leon Dor, right? people can't fucking trust his taste level that's why when these new balances come out no matter how many of them are of the same silhouette just different colorways people are still going to buy them because they trust his taste level and they like the colorways same thing goes for um, nicole McLuhan. like if she puts out shoes no matter what the brand is that people are going to fucking jump on it even if it was fucking umbra or something even if it was reeboks right the reeboks i think did pretty well from what i can remember when they first came out so it's just cool to see really that's the only thing i wanted to say about it i wanted to really say that like, it's just cool to see now going forward that the newer generation are able to do more of these collabs and not have the brands go crazy and think that they can only do one thing there's loads of things they can do together and again you know maybe i wouldn't wear these you know daily but i could definitely see these being a good cycling shoe they're definitely a good walking shoe like they look fucking cool i think you know when it comes to the colorway again when it comes to the collab the brand meryl kind of needs a little bit of love and it's kind of coming back into the zeitgeist or it's kind of coming back i cannot say because i think it's coming come, coming back into the culture and shit a lot of kids are kind of jumping on Meryl's and stuff and they're doing some really interesting collaborations going forward and whatnot so I really appreciate what she's been doing and again um, a lot of credit goes to the brand also for giving her a chance and not being scared that she's collaborating with so many different brands out there and thinking that it's going to take away from what they're doing because if anything it feeds into what they're doing so big up McClure McLuhan for absolutely smashing it and if anything I think it's the correct time as well. She's slowly but surely kind of phasing out all that upcycled shit, leaving everyone else to kind of do it and pick up the scraps because she's kind of been leading the charge and then getting into doing more of this 
brand consulting work, collaboration work, however it's coming about, even if you have to pay for it, who gives a fuck? The fact that she's doing it and putting a taste level out there is fucking cool. And I can't wait to see what else she produces going forward because I definitely trust them when it comes to taste level because these things are fucking banging. And again, I wouldn't even look at Meryl if it wasn't for these cool collabs. And it kind of goes, goes to show the power of collabs, right? Because again, I wouldn't really consider Meryl as a brand to wear in terms of footwear. But when it comes to collabs, that's what they're meant to do. They're meant to bring new eyes to your brand. Um, they're meant to make people maybe take a double you know a double take at some of the shoes and the product range you have to offer and you would hope that you know she becomes like a a gateway into their whole product range and going forward they put out more interesting things maybe they put out gr colorways of this um one trl and then for going forward it could be something that she can kind of continue doing going forward so let's see how it kind of plays out let's see how it plays out but again big up Nicole McLuhan always doing great shit it's great to see it's absolutely great to see moving on from that one and moving on from things that are great to see we have to talk about Jound, right one of my favorite 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 brands out there and favorite sites i'm um, just a big fucking fanboy of justin saunders been following the blog Jound <clears throat> since its inception really before even they got into doing the whole bin trail thing before you probably met virgil that whatever thing when you used to scroll down to the bottom and it would say oh no let's go to the top at the top it'll say this is the this is going to be like your favorite website ever, right? And if you don't know about Jound, in the early days, they used to have this mood board on their site where he basically updated, you know, randomly here and there right with images and i think in the beginning it was kind of uh, you know you could see when he started was starting to blow up and you know get more opportunities to do cool interesting things and shit because he would not update as often but he could you know, maybe do every two weeks every month and shit and they build these cool images he collected over the internet mostly like a tumblr type of feed really clean design minimally done a lot of it was kind of color coordinated in a way loads of great imagery like old port like the stuff you see nowadays david granted but back then was cool like old vintage porsches incredible architecture great interior design great furniture um just cool images you know beautiful girls people guys smoking signet rings all that cool shit and i remember i had the fucking honor one day of having one of my images one of my pictures of my shoes that i was wearing featured on jound if i can find the image i'll get up on the screen now and put it there so you can see it but i was featured on jound many 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 years ago and it was a real honor to have my fucking feet fucking poking out there so if you know my feet and you know how they fucking burst through shoes you'll definitely be able to see that, that was me anyway that being said um they've got a couple of collaborations they've been doing in Reebok over the years and I have to be honest like my aversion to Reeboks has been mostly based on my upbringing because I'm from a particular a particular part of London right that I kind of grew up in in terms of like Canning Town Custom House area that's incredibly incredibly racist right there's a lot of kind of BMP National Front type of people in those type of areas even though a lot of kids are in those areas are also mixed race which probably might have you know led to the fact that some of them were racist right a lot of families with deadbeat dads and shit so they kind of turn their attention to anybody that you know of my kind of complexion and think we're all fucking pieces of shit you know kind of is what it is but one thing that you would always wear is Lonsdale Reebok and I forgot what else maybe yeah mostly Lonsdale and Reebok so whenever I whenever I look at some whenever I think of Reebok classics Reebok workouts the first thing I think about is oi mate oi you oi mate oi mate I mean and fucking guys running after you and again like, that's happening when I was younger I literally have like these crazy white dudes running after me around the area and shit ways of beating me up just because I happen to be born you know a couple of shades you know dark than them right just a couple of shades <laughs> we're just fucking crazy obviously when we all got older and we started to fight back we realized all these guys were pussies but when you're younger and you're seeing all these grown men with beards running after you you're scared isn't it but once we all kind of got of age and kind of fought back it's the same thing with all bullies if you just punch them back one time they usually kind of you know fold into themselves but regardless that association with racist groups and racist people has kind of unfortunately carried on with me which is why i've never run rebooks and even when I got into CrossFit and the Nanos were the big shoe at the time, I never wore them just because of that. I just never, it just got, you know, there's too much PTSD, too much bad feelings around Reeboks. But of course, over time, you know, you mature, you get over it. And slowly but surely, with every fucking jam collaboration, I've been like, you know what? I might have to fucking try and give these a go. I might have to try and give these BMP AF1s a go, right? And I think I might have to start with these Jones CL Nylons. They might have to be the first one that I kind of have to jump on because these are really nice. And again, John have done a ton of collaborations with Reebok. It seems like a, a long-standing collaboration 
partnership with them i also like that they don't try to like you know force new models onto jound they just give him the stuff that he wants to fucking do actually i'm fairly certain for the time i was working in the industry or closer to the industry back in the day when i was you know uh, around more i remember hearing somebody say from reebok that they wanted to they were kind of upset that every time they'll collaborate with somebody all they wanted to do were reebok classics or reebok workouts they didn't want to do anything else and they were kind of wanting to expand their product range or get someone to do like a new shoe but the only shoes people cared about were the Reebok Classics and the Reebok Workout so it kind of put them into a bit of a corner right it kind of limited their options and it kind of didn't give them a chance to grow but I guess now with Jown maybe or just in general over the years they might have accepted their position when it comes to the sportswear hierarchy and shit and they're willing just to kind of give you know Jown I forgot with the other guy as well there's there's a contemporary artist dude who does some really cool collaboration with Reebok too um um, and and, they've, and he just he just basically does the same model in different colorways and shit all the time instead of trying to do like a new model that they're trying to push and same thing goes with the CL nylon that you know Jan have done or maybe they've done something similar before I'm not really sure but it's just cool to see that they give them the opportunity to keep going back into the fucking archive and taking out the classics instead of pushing these fucking horrible fugly new models that they want kids to be on because you know no one really cares about them unfortunately and this particular one I feel like is really really tastefully done as you can see it's a nylon CL I guess you'd call it you know a, a, maybe a nylon Reebok workout but it's a bit different in that regard you've got this really cool mix of um, suede and nylon on the upper very minimally done you've got this great um, tab here with a chant written on the with it with the font as well no belt no crazy bells and whistles just a really crisp and well done fucking um, collaboration on the back hill tab it kind of looks like that might be 3m so again really tastefully done as well this nice sort of 3m detail kind of reminds me of how you know old running shoes were in terms of you know allowing people to have the option if they want to run at night just put a bit of a 3m tab there so in case anybody were to run over the street they could see you um, you've got this nice tonal what is it tonal I guess off-white tongue with the laces done as well and again just crisp not really no craziness on there just a really nice collab and i really like them i'm not gonna lie i would actually wear the hell out of these no cap and again i'm not really the biggest reebok dude but these nylons look very very well done nice again nice suede on the mud guard nice nylon tip there again maybe i would have switched this for a mesh because I feel like this nylon might crease a bit weird over time because of this weird spacing here, right? There's not a lot of this joining the panel. I'm not really too sure. Maybe that's just a bit maybe nitpicky. Obviously, the sock liner being this crazy crisp plush white, you might have to put on a new pair of white socks every time you wear them. I kind of liked how this is done, actually, the tongue and the laces. They look like they've been pre-aged, you know, by having this off-white ivory tongue and the same stained laces effect going on there you've kind of got this really crazy um yellowy kind of vibe on them which would you know you imagine would happen if you actually had a pair of co nylons you know on the shelf for a long time maybe you'd maybe dye the midsole also but i like this addition i think that looks really cool on there and then continuing on again as you can see the heel tabs again like i said most likely these are 3m the hits there so again if you want to wear them running or whatever you can definitely be okay with that and then you've got the gray outsole there very classically done again no crazy bells and whistles maybe i would have gone for a clearer sole there who knows but i do like the fact that they've just done in a really nice classic way minimal way as you know from jound with nothing else on there to kind of distract you from the design and the shape of it as you can see here some details nylon suede leather upper terry cloth lining oh terry cloth lining look at that god almighty i've got a couple fucking nike sweatshirts that have a terry cloth lining and let me tell you they are very warm blank nylon tongue with foam padding eva midsole rubber outsole giant window box logo and a great cotton lace with an off-white secondary assembled in vietnam i always love their product descriptions and details really really fucking cool um as you can see here nice campaign picture of a dude sitting down on his very nice trendy fucking chair great desk incredible monitor with these fucking nylons and looking at some of the fucking imagery as well they've done when they did the collaboration together so yeah big up them i fucking love it looks really really cool again justin saunders and that whole john gang absolutely smashing it 
and always doing cool and crazy collaborations going forward um they're going to be released on december the 7th thursday 12 p.m est on jound and december 14th at reebok global channel so definitely check those out if you're a fan of reebok but yeah i think these look cool and again look at the box just crisply minimally done all white with the kind of ivory off-white logo you can just barely see Rebook on the top and jump to the side. So yeah, really, really cool and really well done. I can't wait to see those when they eventually are out there in public with the peoples. Moving on from that one, I wanted to talk about some E1 news. Again, I was kind of over the moon about this because I feel like I've been on my own, kind of barking into the wind about E1 London and how fucking horrible it is as a club. But I've also kind of calmed my hate for it because I've also realized that unfortunately E1, I think is like, the new version of fabric for us in london or for the new kids coming up is their version of fabric because when i was coming up fabric was one of the worst clubs in london not because of the lineups or because of the bookings but mostly because of the crowd and the security right they'd fucking ruin your fucking nights and it was a real flip of a coin because unlike with e1 i feel like e1's crowd is mostly you know is mostly depend yeah the the crowd were being good or bad is mostly dependent on the DJs playing or the label or the promoter, in my personal opinion. If it's like a really youth led, you know, bro y type of DJ or promoter, you're definitely gonna get a bit of a, you know, a bit of a marmite crowd in that respect. But I feel like fabric is really hit and miss. It doesn't matter who's playing people just go there because they know it's a good night out right or they know it's one of the only clubs in london especially in that kind of central location that's open until 6 or 7 a.m so just a crack it attracts a general public it's just very strange sometimes you can go there you see loads of university students you see those people from after work from you know work parties you see music heads you'd see caners it's just too much of a strange mix of people and the layout i fucking hate going up and down going to out, up and down fucking stairs to go to smoking area toilets long queues security knocking on the door for the toilets and it's just a fucking nightmare. The only thing that's really good about Fabric is room two and the other room up the, up the stairs. I think it's room three, right? I guess room two and room three. Those two rooms are fucking sick, especially when they refurb room two. Oof. Room two sound system, especially when you stand near the middle of the front, is fucking phenomenal. That whole place is fucking cool. Don't get me wrong, but it's a bit of a nightmare. E1 is occupying that same space, but the problem with E1, or one of the hard things to kind of, you know, to, wrangle in your head is that they have some of the best lineups in london in e1 they have some of the best lineups now i'm going to prove it to you that's on the best line because just look at the fucking resident advisor listing for e1 right um just on the first of december this week on the first of december they've got an i hate models extended set alongside um, e um ekata pablo bozi i'm a big fan of um antonia de Iglesias and polanski right um and then they've got a mixed mag 40th birthday party over mono is fucking playing right and if you've seen the fucking recent um over mono set on fucking boiler room you're definitely going to be hyped for that one um continuing on They've got a Teletech event happening on the Sunday with Anthea playing, right? Alongside Solomon and Tekra. They've got a Valve Sound event happening. They've got a Labyrinth event. We don't care about that one. They've got Club Verboten happening, right? If you're into those kink parties, you'll know about all about Club Verboten and the parties that they do, right? Fucking incredible. They've got Hector Oaks, Patrick Mason, my guy, Carmen Electro, who I always find out mostly because of whore and fucking Boudica playing. Like, look at these lineups in, in the next few weeks. 16th, the, the week after that, on the 17th, they've got a GW Anson creature. We'll t I don't know who these guys are. I'll skip that one. They've got an audio hall um, night happening also. They've got a percolate event happening, right? For the And again, New Year's Eve or the New Year's New Year's Eve to New Year's Day lineups is fucking incredible. They've got the first one on a Sunday. They've got a percolate 30 hour party, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Job Josie, Midland, Leon, um, Vine Hall. Bonabu, Nix, Reese Spooner, a few other people. Then they've got another one happening with Job Jose, Midland, like young Marco playing. Then on the first, they've got a sixth birthday party. Dax J, Helena Half is playing. Uh, Maron, DVS1, like Ego Death's happening, right? They've got their. They're like an up and coming, um, what you call it, party as well in London that's doing some great things. They've got some of the best lineups. Like, again, that New Year's Eve, New Year's Day lineup is just maybe one of the best you're ever going to get in London for sure. Like, that lineup is fucking stacked to say the least, right? You already got here. Um, 99909, Dax J, Devious One, Maron, Blashet and Out, um, Theo Nasher, Antonio D'Inglesias. And who's this person? 
um, something and pre silent as well playing there. So incredible lineup. But unfortunately, they also have one of these issues, right? As this person pointed out on the fucking techno subreddit. Look at this. Really bad experience at E1. The person writes as follows. I was really looking forward to a more grab event on Friday for ages. We traveled all the way to London for it. I've never seen an event so oversold before and with zero crowd control. There was like a hundred people trying to get through this one corridor at once. There was serious danger of people getting crushed. I saw a couple of girls crying. Loads of people were leaving early. I saw a group of people break through a locked exit because it was impossible to get the tiny to get through the tiny main exit. It's never been so difficult to leave a club before. Three of the six of us left within 90 minutes and the three that stayed couldn't get in the room more grab was playing in anyways. Update. Looks like there was been a few bad reviews on Google this weekend. One saying that people were passing out and weren't able to be carried out of the crowd. So for me, this is obviously horrifying, especially when you consider everything that happened at the fucking Astro World concert with fucking Travis Scott and shit. But this is definitely part of the course when it comes to E1. I've definitely noticed whenever I've gone there for a popular night, and usually people only go there for really big nights anyway, because again, they're one of the only clubs in London that have a really good booking policy in terms of kind of booking all these. I don't know the the guys on the on the come up in come when it comes to like Europe and shit. Who are playing all the big clubs around Europe in the places that we all kind of know and love. But they also have a good job of promoting a lot of the local promotion uh, promoters and stuff and kind of giving them a chance to kind of, you know, play or put on parties in a bigger sort of venue. Because I'm, I'm guessing when you combine two of the rooms that they have at E1, you're probably looking at 2000 plus, right, in terms of capacity. So if you're a promoter that was doing stuff at fucking Night Tales or at Fold or at Venue MOT, that's a really good verge place to kind of step up and see the kind of um, the kind of pool that you have out there. So I definitely respect them for that. But one thing I've noticed over the years, they definitely have a tendency to oversell. And it's a problem only because in London, we don't have any door picking. Right? Door picking doesn't exist. So when door picking doesn't exist, you should only sell based on the capacity really and truly. Because most likely, especially with the lineups that they have, you're going to assume the majority of people that bought tickets, they're going to arrive. They're going to get there. They're going to go. They're going to attend. Even if they sold the tickets, the tickets are going to be accounted for. So you can't really oversell because you're going to get everybody in, right? You're not going to door pick anyway. Unless somebody's absolutely, you know, caning it in the fucking queue, most people get in despite the fucking crazy searches and then again the fucking searches are a fucking vibe killer so you, you're you already in a queue for an oversold fucking party you're now having to queue up for let's say 20 minutes plus for a party that you already got a ticket for which is fucking annoying then you get to the fucking security place and it's like going through the airport right you have to fucking strip take out all the stuff out of your fucking pockets lift your arms up and shit take a picture of your id all these fucking crazy intrusive shit then by the time you actually go to the actual place itself the main venue the doors are annoying, like heavy to kind of open and stuff. There's always people coming in and out. It's a narrow corridor. And as soon as you get in, the first thing you notice is like, oh shit, there's no air con. Because that place is, it's, it, if you think Fold is hot, E1 is like another level. It's legitimately another level. If you think if you think Fold is hot, E1's another level. At least Fold, if I'm not mistaken, um, that one air conditioning towards the front actually works. So, or even the one at the back actually works towards the toilet. So you can actually, if you want to get a breather, you can get in there without going outside and go back in again. But the problem with E1 is that if you are in the middle, you may have to take all your clothes off because it's going to be super hot. Or you have to go back outside to get a fresh air. And then they have one of the worst smoking areas in the world. It's literally like, I don't know, the width of like maybe three people side to side. You have to kind of stand in this weird position and then it's really packed on the corridor. They've got sometimes this chill out room on the other side is kind of okay. But again, that's all damp and hot and sweaty and shit. And just a terrible place. And I think a lot of the issues that they have will be greatly reduced if they had a bit more of a door picking policy at the front. If they were able to kind of, you know, um, send away some of the people that bought tickets that were basically, you know, way too far gone, too drunk, too high, or maybe just kind of temper the crowd and make sure that they can kind of slowly but surely drip people in. Or for the most part, just sell tickets based on their capacity and don't oversell. Don't be fucking greedy bastards because I guess that's what they're doing. And maybe the greedy bastard thing, is a bit unfair because it might just be a, a kind of an issue with the with the fact that how much you have to pay for that space right because if, if i'm not mistaken that space used to be studio spaces right and they basically redone it and renamed it or kind of you know under new management called the e1 london and it's a really i think 
good location when it comes to London because I think if you live in wherever part of London you live in, north, east, south or west, you can get to it fairly easy within probably, I think, less than 45 minutes, even, you know, if you go there pretty late. So it's pretty decent in that regard. But unfortunately, again, because there's not a lot of places in London that are open past 4 a.m., it's going to attract a big crowd. They've got a really good booking policy, very international. A lot of the Spanish, Italian people come out really, really strongly for a lot of people that they really love and support from their kind of home country country um and again you know people are going to go out and party anyway because there's not really a lot of cool places to go to that have good booking so you're going to attract a big crowd so really overselling these type of events is really not on but again it's no surprise because like i said it's one of the best and worst parties sorry on the best and worst clubs in the country i swear to god and this lineups as you're seeing here for the fucking you know up and coming parties are a good example of it um they've got a rave happening i think with fucking helena half i think she's actually playing if i'm not mistaken she's actually playing the entirety of let me actually double check this if i'm not mistaken let me see e1 london events i'm pretty sure she's playing a new year's day all by herself so again, Helen Half is one of my favorite fucking DJs anyway coming up. So imagine that being a fucking great rave to go and attend. That's fucking awesome. So she's fucking killing it and smashing it when it comes to that. So the bookings are always fucking sensational. But unfortunately, the club itself is just such a fucking nightmare. So as you can see here, as we scroll down, let me actually see the list of things for the raves coming up they've got yeah this i don't even know who these people are for aztec this event is allegedly sold out as a tech house rave right look at that sold out already and this is happening what on the 22nd of december you've got someone called aaron d playing bobby davis enigma gw harrison corin intuition creature and again i give them a lot of credit because they don't only try and play like i think folder a little bit more snobby i'd guess than e1 i think if they're not into some of the stuff people are wanting to push they're probably not going to give them the option to put on a rave which is for the better or the worse but i think e1 are just you know they're just a space. If you can have a viable party, we'll put you on. So they're catering to the tech house crew, to the dub crew, dubstep crew, bass crew, techno crew, house crew. That they don't care. The only thing I haven't seen really in E1 is disco raves or maybe housey, you know, non-tech housey, housey type of parties. You don't really see them putting on there. But big up them for putting that on. Um, and again, like I said, for their raves coming up, there's a one. Is did, did I see the hell in the house? Or has that been cancelled? Is that, did it get cancelled? Maybe it has. I thought Helena Half was playing all night long at fucking E1. Or am I mistaken? Let me double check this. Maybe um maybe I'm fucking smoking that good bush. But I thought Helena Half was playing at E1. Or maybe the, they've changed it now and made it not just her by herself. Maybe it's gonna be with other people now going forward. Okay, or maybe I'm just I've just got it completely mistaken. I'm not really too sure. Let's see if I can find this. It says percolate. Okay, so so maybe it's a per maybe it is the percolate event. So if you go on Resident Advisor for New Year's Day for E1 for Sunday, the 1st of January, you do have, okay, Helen Half is listed on Warehouse. So maybe it is that same day. All of them are playing in that. Yeah. So I guess you get Hi I Hate Models, Helen the Half, Ellen Allian, Dasha Roosh, L LSDXOXO, Fadi Moham, um, Antonio D. Inglesius, and Priest. Like, come on, man. This is a fucking sick lineup. Like, they really fucking smash it when it comes to these lineups. But again, the club is so fucking terrible when it comes to just having a good time and the crowd and the security <coughs> that it makes it hard to really enjoy. If anything, the sound system also, I think it's a bit overrated, personally, my own opinion. Um... I, I still think the sound system in Fold is the best in London uh, and maybe Room 2 in Fabric. They're definitely neck and neck. Uh, and maybe even Venue MOT because I just love how fucking low that fucking club is, right? It feels like a really grungy warehouse, whatever. So that's really my kind of vibe. But when it comes to just pure sound, Fold is definitely on a league of its own, right? They really fucking do a good job with that fucking space. Again, maybe it's easier to handle because it's basically one square and it's not that big. It's probably 750 capacity, right? That main room that they've got. But they fucking smash it. But again, Again, like I said, E1 is just such a fucking nightmare of a place to go to. But let's see some of the reviews from people here. Um, someone said here, sounds like a shitty promoter, same as it could be with any good club. It definitely looks like a really good place to be. The music is great too, just impossible for me and a lot of others to enjoy. The promoters definitely didn't care. I, I wouldn't say that's true. I wouldn't say it's all up to... Let, no, let me take that back. It could be true. Because I guess if your club, if you're um, 
what's that place called? The one that does a king party is called. I just can't. Is it Club Verboten? I think it's called, right? And a few others. And I think maybe even Boudicca, when they did parties there, they go out of their way to basically have their own security. They'll hire their own security or they'll pick from the security available at E1 guys who maybe get what they're about, who are comfortable dealing with the people that they're going to be kind of inviting to the party and what make them feel awkward and whatnot. Maybe they'll change the protocols of security and shit. Maybe they'll have um, safety awareness people with fucking bibs on walking around and shit so people do go the extra step to kind of make sure that they can kind of use the space as a space but they have their own people right i'm sure that kind of happens but i just think sometimes the 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 mechanics of a club and the culture of a club are just what they are there's just not really much you can do sometimes as a promoter it is kind of plug and play and i'm saying this as being a former promoter myself i know how it is sometimes it's just you know it just is what it is you can't there's only so much you can do if anything the most you can do is just basically cultivate your community and make sure the people that you invite to your parties or the, the community you cultivate over the years are just the right type of people and they're the ones that sort of dictate the mood and the vibe and again like i said in a country like the uk and a city like london where door picking is really kind of frowned upon and people take it very people don't take it the right way in terms of how it's you know the function of it i just think you're always going to end up in a situation um, another one says e1 has no real culture of its own i agree with this one as a kind of a pseudo permanent space where studio spaces was and redone it's extremely variable depending on the night and on the promoter i can't say i'd imagine people would call themselves e1 regulars exactly and more grab is kind of well for the kids as they say pity you had to bad night but like others have looked to promoters and chalk it up as bad promoters yeah that's a problem because e1 doesn't really have its own culture its own little scene maybe that's what fold did a really good job of with unfold and i don't think it's even unfold thing i just think the fact that they supported a lot of like grassroots promoters it kind of helped them sort of cultivate a community around them and obviously a lot of the stuff that they do you know in terms of um i forgot the night they have where they kind of have all the resident djs playing there and stuff that kind of helps it but the main thing i think is that the people that they're booking to play there i think there was one particular night that i went to where a lot of people had a bad time at fold i forgot who was playing i'm gonna say it was like let's say some of these house guys coming up like christian a b and shit right and a lot of people really didn't have a good time i remember seeing some of the reviews online about it and people didn't like the vibe and mostly had to do with the fact that it was like mostly a tech house crowd and again that wasn't that wasn't fold's fault but that's when you can see the difference i think it might be like a toy toy event so it depends on the crowd right like it depends on the crowd it depends on the promoter really um who they bring along and i guess as you as a raver you have to be a little bit aware of that like if you go and you know if you go and see i forgot who the guy is but there's a lot of kind of kids out and there's i've got the group what they called again i think it's i forgot what the group is but there's a particular type of people that you'll see even like a cobalt seal and stuff they will attract a certain type of crowd and you have to be okay with those people attending those parties and being in your space because they're fans also but they might kind of you know kill your mood and your vibe but there's not much the club can do about it because it's mostly the fans of the dj and again it must be really hard as a dj because you can't really choose your fans either because you know they're just your fans they come along when they come along so you kind of have to make it work in that regard um another one says so at e1 could nice be good depending on the promoters or it's such not a good place um i would say in my personal opinion it's just a really random place i wouldn't say it's good or bad that's why it's probably better than with fa than fabric because fabric i think overall is just a bit of a shit club in my personal opinion it's just not the best place to go to now i would rather spend my 30 pound because again the ticket price of fabric is no joke so you have to commit a lot of money there you probably have to get an uber back like you know the drink prices are crazy you get them in these shitty plastic cups i just i don't know i just know the toilets you have to always have be wary because there's security banging on it as well so you can't really get on it in peace so it's fucking annoying so for me all those things are too much of a vibe killer and things to think about for me to go there and spend my money so i'd rather go somewhere else the thing with e1 that they are okay with like i said it's mostly they don't have a regular crowd there so it's not always shit but it's mostly the promoters and the crowd that they bring no, it's mostly the promoters who they who they book and the crowd that that dj brings is going to dictate the night but again the issue is that for ebon is like the better version of fabric and also the easier club to get into compared to fold so most people will go to e1 just because it's less of a hassle do you know what i mean in that regard um another one says i've been a few times before and it's been nowhere near as busy blame the promoter yeah true but again like i said when it's not busy it's also not the best place to be at because the sound sort of spreads and it's kind of a weird vibe i've been there twice already overbooked and the smoking area is fucking shit is again like i said i think it's horrendous bro the only way i can smoke in e1 is to hop on those concrete platers it's so fucking hot inside that you need fresh air every 45 minutes exactly what a fucking shit show and again it's not you don't really you know this air conditioning doesn't exist in the uk overall you know what i mean sometimes you'd go to a fucking pret-a-manger and there's not gonna be fucking air conditioning in there 
there it's not something you're going to be labeling only at fucking e1 but at least have one working you know like i said i think fold have two working i think they have maybe three or four but they have two main ones one at the front and one near the back so if you want to get some fresh air you can just stand underneath there quickly and then dive back into the fucking mosh pit get back in the middle of the crowd and fucking go crazy you don't need to keep going outside because i think going outside is of, of course do it get your breather but it can kind of ruin the mood and ruin your kind of vibe and shit you don't need to always be popping out outside every single minute you can just chill inside for a bit so that's a bit annoying another one says sounds pretty unprofessional things can get ugly between people and on a space to move around exactly the main um, concourse corridor was relatively small and it was potentially a couple of hundred people jesus christ it's always full in there don't get me wrong for the clerk room because i think if i'm not mistaken as you come into as you you know walk up to e1 there's a long barricade that you have to kind of queue around right that kind of feels like you're going through fucking you know the immigration thing at an airport which is annoying you get you obviously show your id you take a picture on there like again like you can go to visit a relative in fucking prison then you walk to security guards there's a table there you do all your stuff in a the pot they fucking scan everything they do the fucking metal detector make sure you ain't got a strap or a fucking knife or whatever and then obviously the search will you pad you down if you're black like me they might look into your hair and shit right and your socks maybe take you after you take off your fucking shoes <laughs> and then when you get past the security then there's a cloaking room before you get in and the cloakroom's got a big queue as well so which is a weird way to place to put a cloakroom on the outside but whatever <clears throat> so there's a cloakroom on the outside you can put your cloakroom there your stuff in there for i think two pound whatever it may be and then you obviously go a bit further and that's where the doors to go in are but the doors to go in are really small it's kind of narrow it's a weird door it's like heavy it's a strange thing when you go there you know what i mean so if it's busy it's really odd because everyone's coming in and out because it's hot and then you have it to go in and you know, it's just a weird vibe and then of course going in um then you start to realize the club is a bit shit and if anything the toilets are decent they don't really you know bother you in there um there's a guy in there selling fucking lollipops and shit it's always fucking annoying but whatever get your money king and then of course the main room is all decent enough second room all right maybe this maybe i prefer the second room to the first room to be fair the second room is what more of a darker feel about it the dj booth is like really high up it's kind of dark as well so you can't really see them really too tough and it really feels cool because it's sort of like you can dance without people kind of giving a fuck because everyone you can't really see the DJs there's all about smoke and lights everywhere you can kind of really get into the mood of things if anything the main room is a little bit too much like you know Jesus you know hands out wide like fucking Jesus type of thing right but the second room is maybe is a bit more of a vibe but again it's just the drink prices are crazy the crowd's a bit too random and it's just not for me people are saying to report it to the H H S C jesus christ is a bit much and that also sounds horrific haven't been to e1 but we'll give it a miss in the future if you're looking for a good club experience in london the only positive things to say about it is phonox door staff sound system crowd vibe are all been good every time i've been there and i love the i love the known flows on the dance floor okay is that i didn't you know that phonox have a no phones on the dance floor rule same with fold isn't there a coincidence that the only clubs that are decent in london or the only night night you know club nights right think about the one i went to recently hotbox and shit the only club nights in london that are actually decent are the ones that the promoters go to some lengths to really control the environment like hotbox has door picking you have to get a membership you have to have a membership to buy tickets the links aren't readily available um adonis the same thing right even though i didn't really have the best of time still they cover your phone sticker and they cover your phone lens no stick no for pictures on the dance floor and they really police that really tightly fold they hand out stickers on in the queue whilst you're in before you get in no no videos or whatever it may be like it's no surprise that the ones that actually take an extra step to cultivate their environment guess what have better atmospheres and ambiance in the clubs who would have guessed it who would have guessed it um what well, people saying fun on you phonics used to be fab but clapham crowd expanded more into brixton and you get a lot of preppy posh kids again that's not an issue that's standard london i think they can get around that so i wouldn't really use that as a as a slight phonics isn't like a techno yeah phonics is maybe a bit more housey but still good recommendation it was definitely the busiest i've seen it absolutely full of students room one was packed out and again maybe this looks it's not really the fault of the club maybe it's just because maybe this is a bit of a unique situation because he went to see more grab right and more grab if i'm not mistaken isn't he like australian or something right and he's incredibly popular with the kids more grab of people kids have been liking more grab since he's burst onto the scene maybe it's because of his, again i don't know much about his come up maybe it's because of his part of his story maybe part of his story was that he was a student making beats in his fucking dorms or something i don't know what it is but kids love more grab so maybe it's just a specific thing a specific thing with him i think of the same thing as like um who's that hulahan kid right i think he's irish or something he's got a really big crowd or fan base of kids as well so maybe it's mostly the kids thing so you know you can't really blame the dj about it you have your fans or your fans but uh, might, that might be the reason another one says room one was packed out completely draining two people um ending up seeing clouds an entire night in 
crowd the entire night the best but they finished half an hour early um in one of the busiest rooms i had seen in a, in a time in the morning huge shame asked the attendant why they were shutting down and he said don't know but someone had taken a shit on the floor <laughs> someone took a shit on the floor that's why they had to close it is that true that's hilarious so it was so busy in that club the cubicles were probably packed with people getting on it taking shits finger banging each other that somebody was like you know what i'm taking a shit on the floor and it locked off the entire rave my mates who stayed behind said they spent the night too in a room too because there's no point going in the other room sounds like they managed to make something of the night but i still wouldn't have stayed exactly pretty much the same solution everyone raves about e1 but it's dog shit <laughs> this person's really laying it down i've been up i've been abused by security the complaint about that it got ignored it's poorly managed welfare is bad i don't know how anyone comes away with a good experience there i don't know why parties like kv um exactly um what you call it what's i gonna say what's kv again um oh i forgot i just said the name a minute ago didn't i kv club verboten right i think that's what they mean club verboten that's happening soon is it did i just say club verboten's happening soon let's go back actually and see e1 that fucking thing I think Club of Burton, and again, Club of Burton are very, didn't Club of Burton have an issue? What clubs have the issue with? That's why they have to move to Berlin. It's quite surprising that they're actually going to E1 because again, like, like like people are saying, but maybe the issue is if you're Club of Burton at a certain point, because they're really big and I guess now with them, um, what's that thing? Crossbreed have gone. That Hubbard King party, they've got cancelled because their founder was, you know, accused of being a bit of a creep. So they got, they went under, which is unfortunate really. It would have been kind of nice if he just would maybe stepped aside and the people would have continued on with it. But maybe the brand was ruined too much in the community, who knows? But now that Crossbreed is gone, Club Verboten is really the only sort of like kink sex positive party that I know of. And obviously they're really popular. They've been really doing big things, you know, for the majority of time. And now they've kind of expanded over to Berlin. So maybe they have such a big fan base. You can't really have it in like smaller clubs because you're not going to be able to, you know, service your fans and your customers and your clients, whatever the community. So you want to have it in a bigger space. And the thing with E1, even though it's a shit club, and you know maybe sort of manage the best way maybe they're also kind of hands off they give promoters the license to do what they want and then obviously it can have a negative or positive effect so that might be the reason why clever boats are not going there because they get a space that's big that can you know cater and kind of you know service everybody and get those people in um they obviously can book loads of big djs as well that kind of expand there um they can cultivate what they want on the inside they're going to change it they're going to have dark rooms all this other good shit and shit they're going to maybe cover people's phone lenses and stuff they're going to have their own security all this good stuff but you know that's the issue of having a shit club like even if they do their own thing inside people are just not gonna have a big fan of it it kind of reminds me a little bit of like a multi-sex and you know that promote that that party series has been blowing up over in berlin they do their raves at watergate and people say watergate is essentially like fabric essentially right in terms of the crowd and the people that go there it's very commercial in some sense obviously it's a legendary club but that trezor the f you know the crowd can be a little bit hit and miss and it can kind of affect your night out so if your night like multi-sex what do you do do you have your party in a dingy rave somewhere even because if i might think multi-sex they kind of want to be a bit more sexy a little bit more fashionable a little bit more you know a little bit more of a fun good time in that respect so having it at watergate overlooking the fucking river and stuff right at that amazing venue and whatnot is a great place to be and obviously it's location but then the issue is that a lot of people have bad feelings or sentiment around the actual club altogether itself so it kind of hampers your ability to kind of attract a good crowd because some people are like you know what i don't care what rave is happening at watergate i'm not going so that's the kind of issue but in london the main issue is that we just don't have a lot of options like it really isn't a lot of options that like you go from doing parties at small under 500 capacity venues then maybe 500 to 750 then it's like a thousand plus you know what i mean there's nothing else around and then like maybe one or two clubs that do good stuff so i can understand why club Burton are taking that risk um whatever uh another one says here i go to club Burton a lot and it's always excellent but i don't but i put that down to the promoters um the staff are always respectful and kv don't oversell not like the described in the post though the toilet queues can be long and the corridor does get a little crowded at times the staff are so rude another person says yeah except for the bar staff who are usually lovely yeah the staff i mean i think they mean mostly the security the security are on and again i don't blame them too much as well it's not their fault bro like imagine the amount of punters that they must see on a daily basis from like the more grab crew from like the dm the drum like look just look at the lineups that are happening like imagine the different 
crowds, the different energies of people that are going to be attending, Teletech fans, Mixmag fans, I Hate Model fans, Labyrinth fans, Club of Boaten fans, Hector Oak fans, you know, Adset fans, all, it's, just too, like, it's just too much. That's why door picking is essential. Um, the staff are rude. This is here. I had one yell at me for sitting at the end of the smoke area where another member of staff said it would be okay as I was feeling rough. I f it, it really feels like a run by a club run by gangsters. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. Hilarious because if I'm not mistaken, it kind of reminds me of that old story of Fold, isn't it? One of the founders of Fold got, did he get arrested or the stuff got, I think their equipment got, you know, confiscated for a period of time because if I'm not mistaken, again, I, I get the hustle. The founders of Fold got involved with some dark web crypto guy and that's how they bought their equipment or something. That's how they bought all the CDJs and shit in the club, which is horrendous, you know. You'd imagine, you'd think Pioneer would have some sort of system or some sort of program for clubs where you can maybe buy equipment on layaway or something, in it because you know fucking folds a fucking institution now in london it's definitely one of the best clubs here so you'd imagine you have something in in you know in hand to kind of help clubs coming up but i guess not i guess if you you just if you if you if you want cdjs and a dgm mixer you just have to buy it yourself so obviously those things are like you know fucking thousands of pounds right the, especially the highest one that you want to get for a club you probably have to spend like 10 grand or something so you know fixing up the club sound system it's just too much so they dipped into the fucking illegal shit and i think they got the stuff complicated so i think that's just a fundamental part of nightlife and clubs club scenes i think people would be surprised about some of the dodgy backgrounds of some of our favorite clubs it's just what it is isn't it because it just takes so much to kind of start it off I guess because I think a lot of the initial costs to run a club are probably incredibly high. So yeah, it reminds me of that. But yeah, that's incredible. It feels like it's run by gangsters. <laughs> Compared to fold this night and day. Like I said, you know, if you, yeah, you know, hey, um, a person from London who's been in a group mentioned fold as well as Phonics, I think. Um, yeah, I basically had the same experience. Someone says, oh, imagine. Yeah, Etap Kayo and Dara Kolosova. Great artists and sound system and lights, but just ridiculous amount of people sold tickets and you could barely dance or interact with people normally. It feels like the promoters only concerns maximum profits and tickets. Again, don't concern with the pro. It's mostly the club the club is fucking shit the promoters have put on the nights and want to book good djs it is what it is the fans are going to be there but again all this overselling stuff isn't the promoters it's mostly the club being absolute cunts about things unless you get the handle on the ticket i don't know how they do the ticket sales and how that happens and splits and shit but i think it's mostly have to do with the fucking club itself another one here totally agree i went to uh mafem around a year ago aside from the promoters getting greedy and overbooking the venue e1 also not made for big crowds with low ceilings it's a it's a visual screen feature which looks so cool on their socials it's a complete scam since only 150 people can stand under it oh yeah true <laughs> traffic control is also on another level of stupidity with so many different small rooms and corridors as well as tight doorways to move around such a shame it turned out that way but it's a difference between a mediocre club like e1 and a proper one like fabric come on bro allow it how can you say you you hate you one but you like fabric some people's choices in clubs just always surprises me like that's insane they're basically on the same level honestly if anything e1's probably worse because they they've got an easier sort of layout to kind of get it right fabric has a lot of fucking you know history attached to it and shit they've got the location which is an issue because it just attracts a weird kind of you know group of people that go there Come on, man. Ewan is ass. A normie club posing as underground, exactly. Pretty unprofessional is an understatement, exactly. I had an experience where before Halloween, the event years ago run by Percolate, they overbooked um, and are incompetent. I saw people getting stretched out by paramedics at <laughs> Halloween. Imagine leaving a club in a fucking ambulance in E1 of all places. As you're leaving in the ambulance, you hear tss from all the guys outside selling balloons and shit hilarious the place should be shut down or they should at least ban those promoters oh my god i reckon i've been to e1 around 10 times it's highly variable had some brilliant nights and some shit ones the more popular headliner is the worst the event i agree usually from a combo of overcrowding plus much more mainstream audience if the interested on ra is pushing 1k a week or two before it will get rammed inside i'm still go back as both rooms can have good sound system and layouts room two is really under exactly see yes, i do room two is definitely the one of e1 it's dark they've got a really cool platform the bars at the, it's like a nice layout the bars at the back it's kind of close so you can get to it um and you can't really see the djs it's like this massive 
black wall and these are at the top that you can't really even see honestly you, can't, you can barely see them it's fucking incredible the smoke anywhere so you just can focus on the dancing and get on it and shit so i love that um also if you want to get on it easily i think room two is probably the best place to go because no one can see you there and there's less security walking around on the dance floor with their fucking flashlights and shit also most five star mention a member of staff's name that's because they have people giving free drink tickets inside exchange for a review oh, okay i did that too to be honest although i got 40 quids worth of tokens for it wow they've got a fucking hustle where they get people to do reviews and they give them free drink tokens jesus christ bro okay so i'm on one side of things right where i'm on here fucking you know giving my unfiltered opinion on some of these places which probably isn't a good thing because especially if i'm an upcoming dj it's gonna really affect my ability to get booked to these places and maybe if i ever wanted to have guest lists which i'd never ask for to be fair it'll definitely you know they're definitely gonna be like get fucked i understand that but the opposite side of things is horrible isn't it? they're doing these fucking paid for reviews this is horrendous man the shilling is fucking crazy again like i said my honest opinion root e1 is mostly because of the management there are the ones that are running it like shit it's not to do with the promoters i wouldn't blame them for overselling the tickets i wouldn't blame them for the security being shit they're not being air conditioning the crowd management being shitty it's not the promoter's fault it's mostly the club the club should be able to deal with that more so when you're a promoter and you do a night at e1 it's mostly a plug and play thing that's why you go there because they have everything kind of set up for you you can basically tweak some things here and there but it's that other stuff is mostly based on the fucking um you know people there and if anything it's weird too because they have so many people working there like even just the fucking cloakroom there's like six people working in a cloakroom it's like how many people do you need to work a cloakroom they have enough staff there they're probably over fucking staffed yet they don't know how to run the club properly it's fucking odd and again room two is the best room and it continues can confirm the stay of e1's honestly alarming went there for the first time then summer to see him um marlon hofstad and i will never go again these people are so bait in it like this guy's the one that's got like crazy amount of views on fucking boydom and i never fucking heard of him so i'm assuming he's really popular like with the normie crowd so he's probably gonna have a norm i mean it's kind of the 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 dj attracts the crowd and whatever so it kind of is what it is and again no door picking so many people that initially couldn't move really rude and laddie crowd ventilation is non-existent like literally so bad i've never sweat so much in my life exactly <laughs> trying to access the smoking area was impossible because there was just so many people and we needed air quite frequently because it was so hot also they didn't have free water at the sidebar which to me is always a sign that the club doesn't care about the people yeah true the free water is at the one at the entrance in it so you have to always leave that's the thing it's so weird you have to always leave the dance floor always to get fresh air um to get even a drink to have a bump or if you have to leave the dance floor you can't just like be there which is odd it's very very strange um i also refused i was also refused water they wanted me to buy a fucking can for six pounds the other room was also empty and playing some kind of trap music i don't know yeah if anything techno people or people that like dance music the, the one thing they hate is fucking rap <laughs> <laughs> just why horrible experience i'll never go back another one same than print works i'm not going exactly I, i'm gonna stand on it print works is one of the worst clubs in london i don't care what anyone says great fucking venue to look at you know visually and shit but as a nightclub it was fucking shit the hype around print works is fucking it just shows you how low our standards are you know what i mean we've got so many shit clubs here people are looking at print works like it was fucking trezor it's not even that it's fucking shit i'm glad it's gone to be fair me and a mate did friday at e1 for a more grab and then the cause on saturday night and day difference in the experience exactly big up the cause they, they deserve a bit of love as well actually um the second time i've been to both e1 seems like a complete cash grab especially the bar and the overcrowding was ridiculous still managed to have a brilliant time although most um although the cause was phenomenal this weekend heading back to e1 <laughs> see what i mean this guy had a horrible time right he went to cause, had the best time, but he's still going back to E1. Why? Because they have some of the best lineups. So that's what they did really well. They said, you know what? Fuck the safety. Fuck the experience of the fans and the fucking punters. Fuck doing it for the scene or for the culture or whatever. We're going to have a space where we book all the big and most popular bait you know trendy well supported well followed djs on social we're going to get them all packed into this fucking club stack as many as we can on the lineups and then just sell unlimited amount of tickets who's going to tell us no who's going to tell us no and so far no one's telling them no because they're fucking killing it look at this lineup here with hector oaks hector oaks patrick mason Car Car carmen electro tara erizo the next room donna nanzen yang and samantha togni from booty like come on bro that's gonna be that's gonna be ram jammo you already know it well go on i don't know well go on hope you had a good time i don't feel i'm going back again after especially judging by others what they said um 
the I hate model ones will likely be rammed as a main room. Exactly. Somewhat frequent to for vault events as people often put um, in room two are nowhere near as popular as room one and E1 security never bother managing capacity. Exactly. I, that's always surprised me it, when promoters do that they'll they'll stack the first room and then have the room two just be all their mates it's like bro split the split the crowd a bit give your mates a chance to play in front of a decent crowd also put some main guys in room two like you know mix it up a little bit don't just stack the the first room of all the fucking killers that fucking kills it and then you have all your mates playing for like two people they walk in and walk out that's fucking so demoralizing a dj seeing people just walk in and walk out all the time because they know that you're not the big dj and they want to go to the other room i like vaults bookings and chatted to one of the guys that runs it on the smoking area and they seem like good promoters in it for the right reasons i just think e1 need to stop late 90 percent of the crisis of the multi-event when ram ram in one room cramming room so um are there any good clubs left in london some fretted um not all happened to mot i've dried it i've rated it in the past okay mot uh, i'm a big fan of it to be fair second went to mot once okay people are not liking mot to see parfait and charlie spot but again look at the see Whenever they say they had a bad time in a club, just look at the DJs they're talking about. Parfait and Charlie Sparks. These are this is good. It's going to attract a crowd of people that most people who aren't Gen Zs are not going to like, you know, because they're younger, they're a little bit more sprightly, they're on it a little bit more, they're a little bit chaos energy and shit. So it makes sense why having a good time. So this person said about venue MOT. I went to MOT once to see Parfait and Charlie Sparks, and though the venue was shit, horrible toilet situation the floor was slippery at the front and sticky at the back <laughs> the smoking area looks like chicken like a chicken coop so many young people off their tits on drugs one guy was being racist to an asian couple and we all had to kick him out and, and ourselves because security personnel was non-existent jesus christos yep was there on friday cloakroom was full literally from the front till the entrance so more grabs room blocked up ended up going to the next room had a mega time listening to clouds and then went back to tommy for tommy hulahan i'm um, seriously though it was oversold as fuck this is my first bad experience at e1 out three times being there get another two got another two events books you want to have that ability in it everyone's saying bad i'm gonna be there again next week <laughs> so maybe that's what we have to do we have to just stomach it like we have to put up with you one because unlike fabric they're not that bad where you're not like, gonna run away run away because the booking is just too good like then no one else is booking those people that kind of lineup anyway i didn't rate e1 as a venue zero chill space the one time i made it for an hour round trip to e1 to see panport the main toilets were broke security guard were extremely rude shouting on our faces the main bar and this is into a dance floor was a few inches from water sewage who knows what gross men were being asked to pee into no no way men were being asked to pee into huge bins the, when was this <laughs> what quite a few years ago 2019 people were peeing in bins <laughs> yo the people that run e1 are definitely gangsters man um, nobody seemed to know what was going on we didn't even manage to get a drink um having only seen a little fiac again fiac um parfait charlie spa all these people they're gonna attract you know the hooligan the hulahan kid um, I never bother going back. Great to hear people are stating the recognize the brilliance of more grab. What a unique talent they are. Nobody mixes hardcore jungle and techno the same way. I would be choked to arrive at that fuckery. Um, he wanted conceptually so cool. Sadly, it's, it's, it's dictated by promoters. Last time I went there, it was more grab 2519 was a shit because of that. I've seen more grab twice in this country. It's better to just attract a shit crowd. Exactly. It's just a crowd. Doesn't matter if it, even if more grab did an event at fold, it'll still be shit personally it's just his crowd unfortunately and again it's not his fault you know you just get that level of popularity you just you know you attract a normal crowd there's no door picking or door selection at the venue you're you're playing at it's a recipe for disaster i think hector oaks is probably it's probably hector oaks is probably the next one is probably going to have that problem he's probably at that level now where of popularity where he's just going to attract a shitty crowd and again not his fault because i think he's a fucking sick dj um, and a really good producer also that was very sad looking forward to friday because i'm finally going to make my techno event the first time in my life but now i don't know how i should go or not i was there last thursday saturday sorry this person says for the rod had event and it was a great experience so exactly but rod had has a good crowd rod had has a crowd of actual heads so i'm not surprised that was good and it wasn't overcrowded the music was so good this friday vault event worth to go that's a shame e1's always like this never heard of a good thing about it so yeah um e1's getting absolutely pelters all over the place but like i said i think it's just gonna be one thing you have to stomach and put up with because it's not going to go anywhere anytime soon the only place in london that books the people that they book to the level that they book them at um the only one close is probably fold and maybe e1 or maybe fold or maybe venue mot or maybe even what's next one that's good, good that does it maybe night tales but i think you know fold and e1 definitely at the top when it comes to booking the people that everyone wants to kind of see from the Euro bigger european acts international acts and shit so it's one of the places where if anything 
just be aware of the people that you're going to go see and i think the crowd would i think if anything you'll have a good idea on what the crowd's going to be like based on the live streams if some of the DJs you're looking to put you're looking to see especially if you see that a boiler room set from them or whatnot or an ra set or whatever you'll be able to gauge the kind of crowd you'll see at e1 based on the people that you see in attendance at the actual events it's not that hard to kind of be able to see who's who to be fair i think so but again maybe i'm in the wrong there but yeah big up e1 and funnily enough i actually might be there <laughs> for that fucking uh, <laughs> hell in the health event on the first so i'm saying all this shit i'm talking all this crap but most likely this event here on the fucking first somehow or the other i might have to fucking get there as well to see fucking hell in the health playing in it on the first of january it's absolutely stacked there right now dax j dax j i'm not really too um interested in seeing anymore because i think he's kind of fallen off personally um maron obviously is fucking sick devious one big fan of um Blash and alex i heard of really good stuff about them too and um, they always kind of getting a lot of fucking love and a few others are on the list but yeah those tickets are still available as you can see there third release any time entry um monday seven tuesday till seven like fucking good rave so yeah you know e1 e1 is what it is and e1 is what it is also another big event happening happening very very soon is the earth to community uh, the event i think that's basically been founded by maron and a few other people out there in amsterdam they do some really cool parties on sundays it's been running for a while they do them in you know other places also but um mostly they're kind of known for sort of like spearheading that amsterdam scene especially this new wave of people and they've also been kind of i think basically responsible for the Rene Wise hype as well right because a lot of people kind of found out about Rene Wise through his association with Esther Camino so they have an event happening in Amsterdam very very soon Sunday on the December 10th um, it says here if you have a caption on their Instagram we're back with a final round of this year so it'll be fucking it's going to be a barnstorm right the final rave before the end of the year at a place called Levin Slang in Amsterdam Sunday the 10th of December from 12 p.m until the end consistent with our tradition the lineup remains unannounced I love that one intimate dance floor a judgment-free atmosphere where the primary focus is on the music and if you've listened to that fucking podcast channel that i've absolutely love called um das techno team you would have known that one of their co-hosts now at the moment who's temporarily doing it for a while she's been really good i forgot her name it kind of escapes me now but she's also involved with the as community um and she's obviously speaks she speaks very well about the reasons behind the fucking rave and what they do it for and the ethos and stuff and it's really kind of you know inspiring to hear her speak about it because like i said Said, being a former promoter myself and now become a dj you kind of understand you know it kind of make, it kind of reinvigorates you to kind of put on raves again and put on fucking events but i would love to see this from my own eyes if anything this might be a good place to go um instead of going burkhan actually for the 19th birthday party because it's on a sunday it's one day i could probably fly there in the evening amsterdam to london i think it's one hour and i don't probably i probably wouldn't even need your accommodation so i might actually go do that to be fair i'm not i'm not i'm not even lying i'm actually going to look at some tickets and see what happens with the flight so i'm actually going to see if i can fly out on a sunday maybe even just get like a, a bed for the eat for the for the following oh no for the night for the morning for whatever whenever i leave in the morning right because i'm sure they've been an after party and then probably sleep and then go home afterwards i think that might be a kind of fucking good option going forward so as the community happening very soon again one of my favorite parties um happening at the moment from the vibes and what i've seen online they've got a really good social media also that kind of gives you a kind of handle on what they're kind of doing and shit <laughs> check that out in terms of what they're doing and if, again if you're looking for a space to go to again you know with um cool interesting djs um a really forward thinking you know lineups and shit as you can see look at this lineup like Rene wise maron um blasher and alat hitman playing like hit and play sorry another one here you see stephanie sykes flints amori playing as well What's that some sign says? There's no better moment than just being in the moment. Please no photos or videos on the dance floor. If the music is good, you dance. Exactly. Love that. Again, idea on the sound, good sound systems, tuning it all in properly, good vibes. Everyone, they're having a good time. You cannot deny it again. Renee Wise, the absolute G there as well, doing his thing. So cannot wait to see what they have going forward. Cannot wait to see what they have going forward. Moving on from that one, we also have news here, courtesy of Burkheim, regarding their New Year's Eve party. They finally announced the lineup. Everyone's been kind of on tender hooks waiting for it, and they finally put it out. And it's the reason why it took so long is because fucking hell, mate. 
like so many fucking DJs playing. I think let's actually count them. Let's actually, how many we got? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 20 in Berghain only, room one. Panorama Bay, you got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. 19 there, right? Playing there. Fucking hell. XSX floor, I think you got maybe 10 and then 10. So maybe 50 altogether, 50 DJs or something playing. Crazy. Um, To be fair, my my lasting memory of the last club Sylvester I went to was the one that they had to make up for the year because I think it was a pandemic year and seeing Pablo Bosi in that XXX floor I forgot the, what, what the room of it was called before but it's the one where it's got all the fucking it's got the platforms in it it essentially looks like a, a scene out of a fucking movie out of fucking Christine Air or something it's so fucking cool seeing Pablo Bosi play and again if I'm not mistaken the, the DJ booth is like up the stairs in some cage at the top like that is absolutely phenomenal that, that memory memory will, will live in me forever and also getting kind of sunned by some gay dude who basically kind of brought me down a peg or two when i basically i forgot why i said i've not got his pronouns wrong or something and he was like oh bless or something <laughs> and he made me feel like a fucking ant i was like oh my god that's when i learned how to okay i'm gonna shut up now when i go to spaces and just enjoy myself and stop fucking sharing some of my fucking opinions or just opening my mouth i'm just gonna you know open my nostrils only <laughs> and my mouth only for the pills but yeah um the cups of vessel lineup is fucking incredible it looks like it's gonna be running from the saturday the 30th of december probably until tuesday i don't think there's anywhere else to, how else is it gonna end it's just too many people playing here um so burger main room you've got too many people playing here answer code request arthur robert dario colosoba don williams um edifimin fadi moham fidel jacko jacko josie rebel big up her joanna norman Noj, face fatal philippa pacho quelza who closed this past weekend absolutely killed it steffi lady machine uav virginia um panama bar you got avalon emerson bashka boris etap kyle gabriel kwarteng um jason kendy kiki Mello, Lou, oh kiki Mello's playing at the new big up her that's a fucking big booking man um mario um Marie Moxamia, uh, Massimo Pellegria, and Barkhammer, Octa Octa, Paramida, Partok, Roy Perez, Sedif Asti. You know, I haven't seen in Bergen in a while. Dr. Rubenstein. I'm thinking about it just now. Well, I wonder why she ain't playing there in a while. She was always there for a good time. Um, Suzy Ijo, Yun Sung, um, XX Floor, you got Boy Shores, Budino. So I guess they're continuing on the kind of house if I from Paramount, XSX Floor, kind of disco y, you know, indie dance, I guess, Phil. Boy Shores, Bodino, Carrie Morrison, Chris Cruz, Cormac. Oh, Cormac's one of my favourites. I love fucking Cormac. So good to see him in uh, Adonis. One of the, the only kind of, you know, good things I kind of enjoyed about that night because I wasn't really in a good zone. But hey, um, Fran Scala, Mala Ika, Pablo Buzzi, Soundstream, again, who I'm a big fan of, great producer. And then in the Salon, they've got Bendit Giske playing live, Bestie Hera, Tobias, Barker, um, Gina Sin Sin, um, Jin Sin, Jin Synth, Nick Hopner, Refracted, Richard Aking, Richard Akinbin, and the Seventh Plane. But yeah, that's fucking stacked. That's probably gonna go on until Tuesday. There's no way the house that they're gonna have all these people playing. It's also on Saturday at fucking you know twelve a.m. like eleven fifty nine p.m. So it's definitely gonna go on until fucking Tuesday. So again, um, <laughs> if you if it's your first time going. I don't know if I'm going to recommend it because it's going to be fucking rammed. So the queues are going to be like end of the world level. Like they're going to be crazy. You're going to be in that queue for ages. But the good thing is that because it's going on until Tuesday, there's loads of time to kind of jump in, you know? So the keys won't be the long, it won't be long all the way through. So you have to kind of figure out whether to go right when they open, go early in the morning when people are still sleeping, or maybe still raving elsewhere. Um, you're gonna have to fit, you're gonna have to work it out somewhere or the other. But the queues are gonna be crazy. Um, but obviously the one good thing is that usually because it's in the winter months, you know, not a lot of tourists will go. I don't think so. Um, it still be busy anyway. But you're gonna have a good mix of people there in terms of a crowd. So it's gonna be a pretty decent crowd there. For the last time that I went to a club, Sylvester was fucking sick as well. And again. You got, you know, it's the best bang for buck you're going to be able to spend. If I'm not mistaken, the New Year's Eve events are usually a little bit more expensive than the regular tickets. If I'm not mistaken, again, I'm not going to, I don't want to put it out there as a fucking concrete info, but I'm pretty sure they they kind of put the price up a little bit higher. So if it's 25, it might be 30 or 40, whatever it may be, right? Temporary price change. So um, be aware of that also. But again, great bang for buck. And if it does flop and you're kind of, you know, you're not in the mood, there's plenty of a place you can go to on that weekend. It's going to be absolutely crazy for events running all the way through. If anything, the good thing about fucking Berlin when it comes to New Year's Eve parties, they usually do New Year's Day 
pretty well. Like they're not really a New Year's Eve type of place. I don't feel like I feel like they put a lot of the energy into the New Year's Day thing because they can party where through the week. So you've got all the options to go and have a good time. So definitely check that out if you're that way inclined. Definitely go and check that out if you're that way inclined. Anyway, that has been the next episode show episode number seven. What was it? I think six, seven, two, eight, sorry. Um, I hope you've had a good time. You've enjoyed what I've had to say so far. If you have, please make sure you leave me a five-star review. That'd be greatly appreciated. If you podcast I've been listening to, if you're watching me via YouTube, please like the like button down below. That'd be greatly appreciated. Also, you'll hear my children day playing underneath my voice right now for you. And I'll see you again very, very soon, my friends. Bye.